Osion Nagata, um, Jeff Corntassel here. I'm from Cherokee Nation, and welcome to another episode of Frontlines Are Everywhere, the podcast that looks at indigenous internationalisms, self determination, and ways that indigenous nations and peoples are resurging throughout Turtle Island and beyond. So, really fortunate today, we're on location at Sartlip First Nation in uh, Chaz Elliott's carving studio. Uh, and so I wanted to welcome Chaz. Thank you for being part of this today. And I'm just going to read a short bio. Uh, so Chaz Elliott, also known as Tomasing, uh, was born in 1995 uh, to the Wasanich and Lekwungen Nations. He was raised in Sartlip First Nation and still resides here, uh, which is where we are today. Uh, surrounded by family and culture, Tomasing began learning the ways of Coast Salish art and Wasanich teacher teachings at a very early age. Tomasing attributes his desire to practice Coast Salish art to his father, Tomasing Thet, uh, the late uh, Charles Elliott Sr., and his mother, Myrna Crosley Elliott, a Salish blanket weaver, uh, also bestowed a passion for learning about plant medicines. Uh, Tomasing intertwines the knowledge of both his mother and father into his work. His art practice focuses on capturing the history, stories, legends, myths, and knowledge of the peoples. Uh, he spends much of his time exploring new mediums. Uh, Tomasing's work can be found in private collections across the world. His local public works are located at Royal Jubilee Hospital, First Peoples Cultural Council, Sydney Town Hall, I think UVic. There's a couple other places that, uh, that your work can be found. And so it's so good to, to have you here. Hey, thank and, you. Uh, I was wondering if you wanted to introduce yourself. Sure, yeah. Start. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you guys for being here. It's a pleasure to be on your podcast, Jeff. It's kind of cool because um, your relationship with my late dad, you were here coming to the shop quite a bit. Now it's through us yeah. kind of continuing on the legacy. Yeah, That means a lot to me and I think my mom and my siblings and all that to have that continuous relationship with you guys. Yeah, I appreciate it. It means a lot to us too. Yeah, my name is uh, Chaz Elliott. I am a local carver to our First Nation of Hwasainich and through my mother's side, Lekwungen Nation. I've been carving, oh, I should say doing art ever since I can remember. My dad was a master carver of uh, plus 50 years of practicing carving and he um, revitalized or he was part of the resurgence of our style of art. It kind of like went into a, a hiatus there for a while during... Um, peak of the colonization of when they were taking a lot of our traditions away and it was only to be seen in museums or private collections at one time our form of art and my dad made it a life passion to um, bring it back and he studied as much as he could from what he could find and learning from what he saw he was able to um, continue that tradition of style of art and use our designs in a way that was unique to our people for thousands of years and uh, yeah, that was his life goal, and um, I was fortunate to have him as a teacher. He passed away last year, and uh, today we're, I like to think of it as his shop still, even though it is, it's mine now. It's uh, still very much his, and um, also my brother. He's not here. He's actually on the mainland, but yeah, this is where we carve, and this is where we are today. It's a big carving studio where we practice our Salish art, and um, thank you guys for being here again. Yeah. Heichka, want to thank you for that. Your brother is Matt. Yeah. yeah. So Matt couldn't be here today, but um, so glad that we could have this conversation together. It ideally would have been dim sum, but yeah. so we'll do it here today. Uh, and so the first question <laughs> kind of off the bat is, you know, uh, indigenous peoples across Turtle Island have been practicing their protocols, their their ways of knowing, their diplomacies, um, you know, their trade networks, even exchanging art mm. and exchanging even different styles of art uh, for generations. And we've kind of talked about this as indigenous internationalism. We're trying to kind of use it as a larger um, concept for ways that we express our self-determining authority. Uh, what, is, what does that term mean to you? you know, what is it, does it, does it share any resonance? Uh, in Indigenous international, in that yeah. yeah, 
Yeah. I mean, when I think about indigenous internationalism, I think about kind of the borders that are there, but they are actually not kind of separating us. If anything, it's kind of illusionary borders that are um, just kind of keeping us apart from all of our similarities and all of our practices. I think about um, how closely related our practices are to our neighbors in um, Mexico or uh, even uh, Papua New Guinea, our style of art here. We use a lot of the same designs and I see uh, some dances and protocols that go on in other areas and it's just the same as here. I think about that when I think about international, uh, indigenous internationalism, I think about our similarities and um, when people coming here, when they see our, like from out of country coming here, um, our art is kind of the first thing they'll see if they're coming through the airport. And what that means to them, I'm not too sure, but I've had uh, people come through the shop who are coming from different places in Europe and they said, yeah, we didn't even know First Nations were here in Canada. We, th we thought that was in the books and the history books. I thought they were wiped out. And it wasn't until we saw the First Nations art, we're like, oh my gosh, yeah, you guys are still here. So definitely my dad had put into words that our art is um, silent ambassadors. You know, they're ambassadors for our people. And when people see our carvings, it does represent our people who are still here. I think that's another way of looking at it too. Beautiful. And that, that phrase, silent ambassadors, has stayed with me for so long in terms of even how we think about internationalism and how when people get off the airport, even when they see your dad's poles or when they see your poles, whether they know it or not, they're on someone else's territory and <clears throat> there are stories in those poles and their sovereignty, right. their self-determination in those poles. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Uh, you recently created our Indigenous Internationalism's logo. Yeah. And I was wondering, you know, it has a, it has all sorts of elements in it, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about it. Uh, kind of how, how did it come to you? And part of this is maybe the artistic process. How did that image come to you? How, what does it mean to you? Yeah, when you approached me to do a logo for your guys' um, program or is that the proper term? Program? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah just those words alone, I was getting right confused. <laughs> All those it's big a words. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot. <laughs> but you guys put it in an easier context for me. And with all my designing, I kind of ask for a scope from the person who's commissioning me to do the design. And hey, what is it you guys are exactly doing? And yeah, I like to have it listed out on a piece of paper because just through conversation, it's so easy to go one ear and out the other. Yeah. So you guys had made it simple. You simplified it through uh, easier words than those big words you used to use in there. Yeah. And um, yeah. That's kind of my process is having a scope and what kind of virtues and things that I can draw from my own definitions of these things of uh, using my artistic capability and drawing from our traditional way of designing and also our stories and histories and things I can relate to uh, kind of what we're trying to portray. So that's kind of how I went about designing the design. If I had it on a piece of paper to see right now, it'd be easier to describe it. Maybe at the end I could uh, describe yeah. the logo. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do that at the end, but absolutely. And it, it, we love the logo. It means so lot, so much to us. Um, and it's got the oh, wow. canoe in there, front and center. Yeah. And then you've got the fabric. So talking about weaving, yeah, yeah it's just got a lot totally. to it. Oh, okay, it's yeah. trying to come back to me. So yeah, I'm trying started. to forget what I did for you guys. But <laughs> yeah, the, okay, yeah. There's two uh, on the top of the design and the bottom of the design are two land masses, and with the colors I chose for the land mass and the rest of the design too, they're all kind of um, of the earth. They're more ochres in their color, and they're more natural pigments that you'll find from the earth naturally. I try to stick to that. It kind of gives it more of an authentic feel, I find. And um, with the top landmass and the bottom landmass, they have a human face designed within it and each on the top and bottom. And also there's a, I think it might be a bird or there's some, there's an animal. There's a, it's an animal or plant life within there too. That's just kind of to represent um, the land and the people and everyone who kind of shares the land and in between the two land masses is a body of water. But before that, at the kind of at the tide line where the water meets the land, 
it is a weaving design and that's what i've portrayed as the borders mm. and i used a weaving design because of how our designs and weaving are actually everyone's designs universally the same way we make our lines when we make our blankets is how they do it and uh, go to South America or you go to Europe, you go to different places, wherever in Africa, a lot of our patterns on our blankets and our weavings, they're all the same, really. So I thought that was a kind of a good way to bring us together rather than separate us. Although it is representing the border, it's also what kind of connects us together. And um, yeah, between the two borders is the body of water with there's a canoe sitting on the water. The canoe is us moving forward together. It's us um, traveling with each other as well as commerce and trade and all that type of stuff that bonds us together, but also um, shows our separation through distance, really. We love the logo. Yeah. Cool. I just you guys for, like it. I just get for talking about that. Um, you've already talked about your your late dad and your mom as two of your biggest influences. Are there other influences that have kind of impacted or shaped the way you do art and the way you uh, kind of work? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, for the type of carving and art I do, like I look up to a lot of many older artists that were in my dad's generation. There's Susan Point and also a little bit generation below there is the Marston brothers, John and Luke. They definitely heightened my idea of what carving could be with the way that they're able to make such clean carvings and the sculptures and the, the type of way they went about doing Salish art was totally brand new and inspiring to say the least. But I think a lot of my um, big inspirations are like uh, everyone else's like Muhammad Ali and I like uh, Malcolm X listening to people like that. And also, yeah, a lot of big activists I find uh, inspire me and I think about it when I do my art too. I might be able to even get an idea out of hearing what they say. And then there's like all in the sports realm too. Like, yeah, like I said, Muhammad Ali, but there's also skateboarders I'm really into. Yeah. I love skateboarding. Yeah. I love uh, fighting. We grew up with boxing and mixed martial arts. So I got a lot of, uh, fa I'm fans of a lot of fighters, I should say. Uh, John Trudell, another activist. Oh yeah. First Nation activist. Yeah. I think there's a lot of like those type of people who inspire me. It may not be like because they're doing art, it's their own way of doing things that I can draw from, yeah. learn from. And they have their own artistry. A lot yeah, of ways. And true. inspiring actually. Totally. Yeah. Poets. Yeah. Poets. In their own way. Yeah. Excellent. Um, you've, you talk a lot about stories and the way the stories influence your carvings. Uh, what are some of the ways that protocols and kind of principles or practices have influenced your work? Or what, maybe a better way to ask that is, what are the ways you incorporate protocols into your work? Okay. You know, like preparing maybe to do a carving or um, the ways that you maybe take take the tree. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, quite a bit of ways actually that every single time we do a carving, it's, um, I guess I should say each carving has its own purpose. And along with that is its own kind of protocol and way I go about it. When I'm doing carving for my living, when I'm actually carving to make money, I'm incorporating a lot of our stories and our history into these pieces. At the same time, I'm actually doing a style of art that is traditional in itself. So um, I am following a protocol of the designing system and when I'm telling the stories, I'm actually um, also carrying on the type of uh, documentation that we've been doing for thousands of years. We, we portrayed our stories and histories into our carvings. It was like a writing system. Um, our art told the story. So that's another way that I'm uh, carrying on that type of protocol. And also I do um, cultural work too. Some of these pieces I carve, which aren't for money, but they, uh, in turn, I. Uh, I am, I guess, uh, contributing to our community. Everyone kind of has uh, different community roles that they come from in each family. I inherited this through my dad and carving ceremonial pieces for different ceremonies, dances, and also a big part of my inherit 
unexpected type of responsibility is uh, funeral work. So I carved a lot of markers for graves and we try to have our uh, loved ones buried within like four days. So usually when a funeral happens, I kind of drop what I'm doing work-wise and I jump on the, for the grave marker for the funeral that you know, might need to happen in a single day or two days when I get notice. I've done over probably a hundred grave markers by now. And uh, yeah, it's heavy work, but along with that type of work, we have our type of ways we protect ourselves. So through prayer, bath, bathing. When I say bathing, I mean, I'm talking about going into a cold body of water before the sunrise and um, doing a ceremonial kind of procedure in the water. Like I'm going under the water, but I'm, you know, I'm praying, I'm asking for strength. I'm also using plants and stuff to protect me. And that helps a lot. You can feel the strength when you get out of the water and you can feel it for the rest of your day. You go home feeling good. And as much mourning and as crying, I might've been around for those four days or wh whatever be it that one day I'm at the funeral. Uh, it protects me more. I don't go home feeling that heaviness as much when I do that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's another way. I think it could go on about how the carving and all that, I kind of carry on protocols and stuff and how I go about it. It's, it's definitely a big portion of my life is being cultural just because of the art is so much involved in our culture. Absolutely. And such a big responsibility, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it does it seem almost uh, so much. Does it feel, uh, how have you kind of dealt with that? Um, I think that uh, I could say no, like I have that option. I don't always have to say yes to some of these yeah. jobs and stuff. I think when I was younger, I didn't know that so much. I felt yeah. like I always had to say yes, yes, yes. Now I'm kind of growing and I kind of know my, <laughs> how much juice I got in the tank. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a bit more of a balance. So I really can't complain. I'm really happy. Like uh, how much I've done in the past now has kind of translated to, I have um, a lot of families have stuck their neck out for me because I've done some work for them. It, uh, what do we say? We pay it forward. So when we do something yeah. for someone else, you know, we kind of hope it'll come around one day. It's kind of like karma. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah, it's like a reciprocity. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, we have some works here. What are some of your favorite works that you've, in, or projects that you've engaged in? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you don't have to pick just one. <laughs> uh, my car. No, I'm just your car? <laughs> yeah. I saw your no. car out there. It looks, <laughs> looks pretty good. Uh, looks sharp. Yeah. No, that's my favorite project. It's ongoing. It's a it's 1980 Camaro. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Uh, hmm. I think I'm really proud of that last one we did for you, Vic. It was a house post me and my brother carved. I should mention him. He's not here today. Yeah. A lot of these projects the last four years were done with my brother, Matt. He, he jumped into carving to help me out initially. And once my dad was getting sick, it was kind of more of he stuck it out with me to uh, get these jobs done yeah. for my dad because my dad had quite a bit of commissions to do. He had, uh, they were assigned on the contract type of deals. He, he's committed to them. So it was our responsibility to finish them off for him. And my brother, he um, stuck it out with me right till like the very last job here. And I, I think that lasted two or three years of us carving um, jobs that were my dad's commissions. So yeah, I'm really grateful for his help and he became one hell of a carver throughout it. Sounds like it. <laughs> Lots of late nights. Oh yeah. A lot yeah. of late nights. You guys regularly would work till I remember hearing four yeah. in the morning. Or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A lot of overnighters. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of happens with when you have a uh, job that have deadlines and then also sometimes, you know, someone might pass away and you never, you never can't really predict that with a deadline you set yourself up for it. So now I'm taking two days off to do this grave marker for this funeral. And perhaps another one happens that same week. I think I've done like four or five in one week one wow. time. And that wow. sets you back a whole week with work. Yeah, I'd hate to say set back because yeah. I don't want to say like my it's an inconvenience. It's not at all. But it makes it a little bit harder to uh, communicate with um, businesses I might be working with. Like, hey, I got another. Funeral. Where they're saying we want it <laughs> yeah. tomorrow. Yeah, they don't quite understand <laughs> this, this side yeah. of the red, like this side of the rest of the track. So I should say. Yeah. Do you think there's a greater attempt at understanding or oh, do you think, yeah, yeah, or, or a willingness yeah. to understand? 
Yeah. I think the, what we call the white man clock, though, yeah. is sometimes hard to <laughs> negotiate. <laughs> that colonial timeline yeah. is always ticking. Yeah, everyone's on a clock. And they're all getting sick over it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it's tough to explain to people, hey, I'm not on time, but you don't want to tell them exactly why. Yeah. I see that with a lot of artists. Yeah. There's a lot of businesses who want it by this date because they have so many other things lined up to have it by that date. Yeah. How much work are they doing to get it done by that date? Yeah. But then here are a lot of artists and carvers. They're doing a lot of ceremonial work, which they'll drop before they, you know, before they make money. Absolutely. They'll help their community out first. Absolutely. So they're not always on time. So I don't know, yeah. times that date by three. Yeah. You might get your real answer. Yeah. yeah. There's a different community timeline that has to be accounted yeah, for. Yeah. Totally. And it's hard to explain that. Yeah. To people who don't live within the community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we have some pieces here, and I know you were talking about this this one untitled piece earlier uh, when we were just in the shop. Can you talk a little bit about that project? It it looks yeah. really innovative and and uh, powerful. Yeah, I can talk about it for sure. I think. Um, can you see it? At fine, where it is. I'm gonna open it this way though. So it's actually uh, it's designed on the outside here. This is a model, it's a life size, the real one you can walk right into. So there's um, a friend of mine named Kim Short Reed. He uh, approached me through mutual friends and we were talking in the talks of doing an art piece that would represent a decolonial map. For him, it was uh, his final project with the schooling. And for me, it was a, uh, it was interesting because it was something that was kind of outside of my normal, my regular, which is carving and big installation art is something I kind of dreamed of. And this was the opportunity I saw. So I decided to collaborate with him and we talked about what would a decolonial map look like? That was kind of his focal point with his um, writing for his final project to get his, uh, I think it was his, his doctorate. It was his doctorate. And he was uh, on the subject of place names, I believe. And with that, he wanted to make a map and he wanted to have like how these colonial place names have effect on these territories. So he wanted to make a decolonial map and we talked about it for probably half a year. Like, what could that look like? Am I carving something? Are we building something that is 2D and we look over top of it? And with that kind of realization is when you're holding a map, it's almost like the land becomes the dominion of man. You're looking over top of it and you're kind of conquering it. You're kind of like pointing out place names as if it's like that easy to look across, you know, the world right, and all that. Right. So we're like, no, that doesn't seem right. And he drew something kind of round. Like, what if there's something you walk into? I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And I was like, oh man, that reminds me of our uh, goat horn Salish bracelets. We would um, traditionally bend goat horn that we would trade through with the interior Salish people and we would bend it into bracelets and design the outsides. And that's what it reminded me when he drew kind of a circular shape you could walk into. And he was like, oh, that's that's a good idea. Like that could be the attracting, the luring to this big, huge project is the outside design. And with that, I designed something for the outside and we talked about like, okay, once you walk into here, like how do the place names of the, the land masses, how, how are we going to do it? Like, oh, okay, let's do the Gulf Islands. Let's pick maybe five of them. And we figured out how to put them on the inner wall. We actually magnetized the whole inner wall by putting a sheet of metal inside the, inside the big, huge project itself in the inner walls. So that when we place these islands on this inner wall here, they stick to it and you can pull them off. And with that, we embedded motion sensor chips inside these islands that when you pull them off the wall, it triggers them to say their name in English. So it's a Darcy Island. And then it would say it in St. Jothan, our uh, native language. So it was a learning tool, really. There was, a, I think there are four or five islands that we um, placed inside this big, huge project. And yeah, people could pull the island off the wall, learn its name in English and in St. Jothan. And on, like, it kind of had a cut out. The designs that I did on the very outside of this were cut out. So we put lights in there so it would shine through the cutout designs. Kind of gave it like a space effect, the stars, like the outside was like, you know, space. And then you walk in and you're in your part of Earth. It was a cool, it was a cool project. And I think it was a, 
it was kind of new to I don't I haven't seen anything like it looking online I I think it's um kind of innovative myself and um the one who pa painted the inner wall his name is Jesse Campbell he's a professional mural painter in Victoria he's a Métis artist and he does wicked art with his graffiti and spray painting he me and Kim we didn't have an art artistic capability to paint a horizon and a waterline and a s sunrise like this guy could this guy could he did it like in within two days and he did it better than what would have took us six months. Wow. Yeah. He was just, just uh, experienced, skilled, knew what he's doing. So he did the inner wall. So it's collaborative between us three. And also my brother, Matt, he was there to help hold things in place and stuff during that time. And I had a, a cousin, Ben, cousin, Ben, <laughs> cousin named Ben. <laughs> 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 yeah. He was there. Yeah. And then my mom was bringing us lunch here and there. So, I like to think it was a big collaborative effort between all of us. It's always a family effort. Yeah, right? it is. Yeah. Yeah. Indirectly or directly, a lot of people are part of a project without even knowing it. Yeah. And how do people respond to it? I think they liked it. Yeah. I think especially the kids having something to, you know, put your hands on. Yeah. You get to hear something. It was kind of exciting for that aspect. Yeah. I think there's so much potential to be done with it too. It doesn't have to be islands. We could be sticking plants on there. Yeah. And you could be learning like the plant name in Sanchothan and in English and what it looks like. Birds, you know, there's so much potential with uh, interactive art, I think, as a learning way, like a method of learning. So brilliant. So brilliant. And it's immersive. You're actually learning about the horizon. You're learning about the seascape. Right. And then the territory. Totally. Yeah. And it is all eye level. So we have legs that slide inside of it when we're not using it. And it, and it detaches in three parts. We put it together, pull the legs out, and it's kind of becomes eye level. And also it has speakers in it too. So we had the sound of ocean shore coming through. Oh nice. As well. Nice. Yeah. It could be could be a bunch of things. It could be a lot of things. <laughs> but we named it untitled because we didn't even it was telling us what it was. We didn't Yeah. It wasn't up to us to really say what it was when it had so much more potential than what we initially thought of because people who come in there like oh it could be all this and that too hey we're like oh yeah you're right it totally could be yeah so people are bringing ideas to it i can imagine this becoming multiple projects yeah right totally like you said around plants right it could be animal naming mm -hmm. yeah all sorts of things it doesn't have to be something you walk into like the same idea take it it could be a whole wall you know kind of orchestrated and maybe a walkway or something like that and I don't know, interactive art, though, I think is a really innovative way of learning. I think so, too. And it, it has such a transformational impact on people. They remember it, right? Because yeah, they've done it. Right. Yeah. Gives you feelings like visiting somewhere. Yeah. Uh, the cod lure. I love this. Yeah. It's a cool Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. yeah. This is a traditional technology here. This is uh, used for luring bottom fish to the surface of the water where they would be netted or speared or gaffed. So earlier in the year, cod kind of moved more inland, uh, link cod specifically. And these would be pushed down about 20 feet of water where the ocean floor sits about 20 feet below the surface and pushed down with a long pole. And once the pole is released from it, this uh, way it's designed spirals back to the surface and I've tested them out. They cut through the water really slowly. That's amazing. I think it's because of uh, the fins. It kind of makes it act like a cork or something. Uh, it's like kind of screwing its way to the surface. Yeah. So the fish is naturally curious, especially link cod. So they actually follow it right to the surface and yeah, upon them going to the surface, we had methods of seeing into the water that we practiced quite a bit. And sometimes people would put a kind of an oil slick on with whatever kind of oils they would on with on water, like a fish oil or something. You could see a little bit further into the water and you could see this cod coming up and it would probably like, you know, get harpoon or spear. Or... I don't know. It's pretty neat because it doesn't actually hook it out of, from the below. It lures it out. Yeah. So it just goes to show how our people were so in depth with uh, animals around them, knowing their habits and being able to uh, not manipulate them, but uh, take a advantage of knowing 
your yeah. relative, right? Such such old knowledge and putting that to work. It's technology. It is technology. This is what's saying it's to technology. Totally. Yeah. Well, you talked a little bit about how you and Matt and others have learned from your parents. Um, what do you think about when you think about passing this on to future generations? What are your thoughts? Not necessarily that it all rests with you, but what are some of your thoughts about how others can t carry this on in the future? Um, those future, you know, those, yeah. I'm thinking of, you know, those who haven't even yet emerged. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what will they know about your artwork and kind of a Wasanich way of doing things? Yeah. I don't know. I, I do get into those thoughts. So I'm like, hmm. Not that you have to have any <laughs> definitive answer. Yeah. I kind of do think sometimes about like what my dad did in his time. Yeah. And like, say, you go a hundred years from now, like that generation are going to maybe hopefully you know study what he did at that time period along with susan point and uh other people who were part of that art resurgence of coast salish art when it was it, i shouldn't say extinct but it was you know it wasn't around period and what they did to bring it back like they're going to become very important figures in history yeah. they might not be acknowledged totally to what i think they should be you know like looked at as today yeah like i think they deserve a little bit more praise that generation who brought our Salish art back. But I think in a hundred years, people are like, holy moly, like they knew what the heck they were. Oh, they, maybe they didn't know what they're doing, but what they did do it, you know, it, it really paved the way for all us young artists. Like they opened the doors, they made, they showed that you could make a living by doing your tradition, which seemed really hard looking at our, our grandma's generation. When they were knitting, they were making like enough, next to nothing. They work on the knitting for a whole month, big sweater. They go bring it in and, you know, they, in today's rate, I don't know, make five bucks per hour or something like that. Like, it didn't seem like it was a good living, but uh, this generation of, uh, that generation of carvers, like my dad's generation, they really did show that you could make a living by practicing your culture, which I thought is super important for my generation as well as ones in the future because it's only getting elevated now yeah yeah getting the attention it deserves yeah and then you're you're telling the stories so that people don't forget these are some of the folks that influenced me yeah and that paved the way yeah the susan points and the tomasic right. like that's yeah. yeah and the murder crosley's yeah yeah exactly yeah <laughs> excellent um the um you know the title of this podcast is front lines of are everywhere. And I was just thinking, you know, this in a sense is, I'm th thinking about even this project, it's really on the front lines of resurgence, especially around art. Uh, what are your thoughts around, what are some of the front lines for you in terms of artistic representation, expression? There's always challenges, but there's also amazing ways to 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 highlight the the, you know, the knowledge and the, the protocols of your nation and your peoples. Uh, so what are, what are the front lines mean to you? What do you mean by front lines? I guess uh, it could mean just about anything that you want it to mean, but you know, what are some of the, <laughs> <laughs> what are the, uh, what are the places that you experience? Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done oh. where, where people, are still in conflict or there's still tension okay yeah um around maybe even how your art is regarded yeah hopefully think, does uh, that make sense yeah, yeah yeah it does i'm thinking i'm right now within community and within outside or outside yeah. community yeah and we I, talked about a little bit with timelines yeah okay. but just any other thoughts around yeah you know? i wouldn't say totally like it's a front line like head on head battle with anybody yeah but i would like to see more of our art within our uh, our language we have a really strong like we're very fortunate to have uh, our language we can graduate in our immersions like our immersion program goes right to graduation now at our local tribal school and i uh i didn't have that when i was there and 
I wasn't there like, you know, 50 years ago or anything. So it just shows like I was there like, I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe 20. And that's and to me, I was like, holy, we're moving pretty quickly with our language. And I would like, be, it'd be cool to see that with the art there. And there's kind of a, not much, there's, um, I should say, a lot of financial support with our arts, with our grants and all that type of stuff. But with a kind of a community push behind art, I say isn't as much there as it is for the language. Yeah, we have schools for our language. And we have like, you know, an art class or two, right, going through our school and we learned a little bit of the designing. But I think it's just as important as like as the language or art. So I, I feel like it's just, a, you know, two sides of the same coin, really. Yeah. It'd be cool to see that kind of be pushed more. And I know my cousin Addie, she talked about kind of bridging the gap between art and the language. Yeah. So she came here, she did her uh, language program. She's a language speaker, in nurse and Chauvin language. She actually did her practicum with me. And she was teaching me a lot of our language for different tools and a lot of the animals that I were like I design or the plants or just even our practices, some prayers and stuff like that. Those are all stuff that she brought here because she's in the language program and I wouldn't have known otherwise. And it's not, I can't just go into the school and go sit down and learn all that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing art, I'm carving, Absolutely. trying to make a living. Yeah. Or I'd have to put that on hold and then go do that. It's like kind of one or the other. Yeah. It'd be nice to have both. We could have both without having to choose one or the other. Yes. And uh, I kind of look forward to like what she's going to do with that bridging the gap, as she called it. Well, and it seems like in a sense, you know, with the untitled project, you're bridging the gap. You know, there's, yeah. there's language. It there's creates resources, shopping. right? Yeah. It's learning More resources. Public. It's public. Yeah. It's interactive. Totally. It's teaching. Yeah. yeah. And it's like first, no first voices is awesome. Like, don't yeah. get me wrong. But not everybody wants to go online and sit down yeah. and, you know, learn from their phone. Yeah. So much more pleasant to be learning with somebody. Yeah. And I think you remember it more if, totally. you, if you have that image. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I was thinking of, too, on in terms of front lines is just how to get the wood. Yeah. Is it getting harder to get to get the wood? I was yeah, thinking of definitely. like artists like Carrie Newman has talked about how hard it is to get cedar. Right. And, you know, the challenges, you know, of, of finding sustainable harvesting. Yeah. Is that, has that been a challenge too? Or is that? Yeah. Cedar is yeah. worth more than gold. Yeah. I really think that. Yeah. And it's a uh, dying off the West coast here. Yeah. It's been logged. It's been logged. A lot of the carving wood that we use is old growth. Okay. It's been growing for at least 300 years. Yeah. And we prefer that for carving because of the growth rings are a lot tighter. I find when I'm carving, my knife, it, uh, when I carve through the wood, it's um, a consistency I get with the old growth that I don't get with the new growth. I'm kind of, so the old growth has really tight growth rings. They're right close next to each other, all these um, grains of wood, I should say. And uh, with a new growth or second growth, they're really spaced out and you're kind of skipping with your knife. Uh, you know, you, you hit one kind of growth ring and it's like it's harder than the, the wood in between each ring. Oh, interesting. So you're kind of skipping the woods coming out kind of chippy. It's not nice, not totally nice to carve. Cedar's yeah. kind of tough to carve as, as it is. Yeah. It's a soft wood. You, can, you really have to follow the direction of the grain with cedar. I find with some hardwoods you can go any direction, but with the uh, cedar, you really pay the price if you go against the grain. You yeah. just chip out your whole mask's face or something. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, it is getting tough to fine like i go to mills over uh, on the west coast there nothing here is all logged and wow a long time ago before my time yeah there's no mills around here that i think there might be a mill in keating but they're bringing in wood from elsewhere just to mill it up there but so i go out to the west coast and when i first started carving and i think i started carving around like 12 or 13 or something like that i remember when i bought a board foot of cedar that would like the type of cedar i would carve it was like two fifty a board foot. Now I go to the same mill. It's sixteen dollars and fifty cents a board foot. So from two dollars and fifty cents a board foot to sixteen bucks, uh, that's like just you that's know, that speaks for itself. Right? That's extreme. <laughs> yeah, it's inflation. So that makes it harder for you to get <laughs> access to the materials for your own craft. Yeah, totally yeah. does. Yeah, 
it makes you kind of value things a little bit more too. Like you're not going to slap anything on this piece of cedar. Yes. You're, you're going to yeah. think a little more intently about what you're going to carve. It's scarce, right? It's yeah. It has to be treated. It is. I think it's such a sacred wood. It's one of the only woods that have, um, it's like a natural preservative in it. It lasts a really long time. It's not very often you find cedar just rotting right away yeah. from being in the ground or on the ground. Yeah. It takes years. A lot of insects don't like it. You know, they probably have a bite and they're feeling sick or something. It's the best feather <laughs> box, right? You made me a feather oh, box. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Keeps all the mites out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all the bugs. All the lice. All the lice. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever other bugs are dead bugs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. Um, what are some current projects you're working on that... <laughs> That oh. you want to tell folks about i know we're working on it or we're talking from a, a carving here but what yeah. are some projects that you're working on that you're really our nation motivated by? our nation has a our own child and family services and they're called Niltua. so they bought a 36 foot strip canoe when i mean strip canoe it's cedar strips that have been glued together it's not dug out of one log it's uh being pieced together okay by one of our best canoe makers ever from our nation uh, len morris he's wow. a he's a champion racer for our for our style of canoes excellent and also on those outriggers but uh, yeah he's a really good canoe builder he built this 36 foot canoe and neil Tawa bought it for um bought it for their you know, their business but they're going to be able to take out kids who are in care on this canoe and it's ocean going canoe so it can travel a distance beyond rough water and they can start partaking in our tribal journeys which happen annually they have two canoes one was done by luke marston and this one was done by len len morris and um, i got the job to paint this canoe so it's kind of a collaborative work with me and len so i'm going to paint this 36 foot canoe and it won't be in the shop like this shop is i think 40 feet in length oh yeah it would so, be tight yeah. it'd be tight <laughs> four feet on each end to work with yeah i know you just have to squeeze around <laughs> yeah yeah so that's kind of the project I'm oh on that's now. amazing yeah yeah it'll be a fun one then yeah. i get my cousin addy i brought her name up once before yeah she's a good artist too excellent skilled one excellent that one's a skilled one <laughs> yeah well you've got major skills too um and what's this one that we're looking at here? Is this, this a... Yeah, this is a big, huge, um, it's kind of a plank style carving. It's gonna go, so it's to see the image, it would be standing upright. Okay. That would be the top, that end down there. And on the top, there's a, a sun design and it runs into the plume. One of the sun rays runs into the plume of the, it's a blue heron. And the blue heron runs into an orca swimming downward. Oh, yeah. And that runs into a wave design. Everything's connected. And I kind of yeah. like to practice that with um, Salish art naturally does that. But yeah. I try to express it a little more in my designing that everything is connected and nothing separated. Although physically, we're not all, you know, Siamese. You know, but uh, this is just a metaphor to show that we are all connect connected. And I pick different elements of earth, the sun and the heron is good for kind of representing of land. Mm -hmm. They're often spotted on, you know, standing on the beach shorelines. Yeah. Also of the air and then uh, orca of the ocean and water of the ocean. This is going to that new um, Amazon building in Sydney. Okay. Yeah. So as far as I know, it was the airport's property that they're on. Yeah. I hope I got that right. But yeah, yeah they, they wanted to have First Nation representation there. Yeah. I think it was great. Like yeah. no matter what kind of business it is it's good to still acknowledge whose land you're on and absolutely and it's almost uh ironic that i kind of chose elements of earth because they're just busy yeah you know? they're busy challenging the <laughs> <Yeah>. earth for... <laughs> i'll i'll hold my words <laughs> since this is going to amazon but <laughs> yeah uh, our packages start going missing yeah, yeah my packages <laughs> might start missing yeah. uh but yeah absolutely and i you're right there's always that that tension of you know okay we're providing this to a large corporate entity yeah however this is a living being yeah and this is maybe teaching them 
yeah. about respect and honor and yeah. whose territory they're on. And if it's not them, there's people who drive past that building. Yeah. And they might even not know what that building is for. Yeah. And they might just see the art for itself. Yeah, absolutely. And it shows, like you said earlier, we're still here. Yeah, We're totally. still here. Uh, last question. Uh, is there anything we didn't cover that you'd like to talk about? Anything we missed? We talked a lot about the art process, but there's so many different aspects. I didn't get a chance to talk about my mom. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, my mom is a member of um, Songhees, which is part of the Kwangan Nation, and which resides on um, like the southern tip of Vancouver Island, Victoria area. So she has been weaving since the 90s. I don't know like exactly how long she has been, but she's been practicing our Salish style of weaving and making very nice blankets on big looms. And she's been just giving her, giving her like the river. Like she's been making blanket after blanket recently. It's really cool. She's looked a lot into it. She's learned a lot of history and how blankets have been used in the past. And she's bringing back a lot of old knowledge that, you know, other families might have really strong within their family, but it's kind of new to our household. Some of the things that she's bringing knowledge wise and yeah, I'm really proud of her. She's also studies plants a lot. So she's able to use a lot of her plant knowledge and bringing it to her weaving. So she's dyed a lot of her wool just from her own harvesting. Super impressive, the colors that she's getting. The process is just crazy, like how long from start to end. It's a, I think there should be a little documentary on there alone. It's, a, it's amazing, really amazing. I'm proud of her. Yeah. I bring her up just because she influences me and I'm, I live with her too. And we're more like roommates. We're like kind of, she comes up here all the time. She gives me feedback. I go down there, give her feedback. We're like more like friends, actually. It's nice. Yeah. It's a good relationship. It's wonderful. Yeah. Well, we invited her. I know she had a super busy schedule, but she couldn't make it today. Oh, man, but she's, she's, she's got to get on here. She's here in presence. Well, maybe we'll have a separate, yeah. we'll have a separate podcast right. uh, with your mom. That's a good idea. Because she does so much amazing work. I was even thinking of the community gardens she did back in the day. Oh, right. Right? And totally. unifying families around community gardens. Yeah. And then her artwork has, I think, has not received the, the attention it deserves in terms of the weaving. Yeah. But she's done some work recently for UVic. Um, in some of the, uh, the new, uh, student housing centers, she's got a blanket that's, that's, and just like you said, amazing work. Yeah. It's really cool to see. Yeah. She helped my dad in his career for so long and she was, she raised us kids. There's a whole bunch of schwack load of us. So that was kind of her for the last, I don't know how long ago, but she raised us and she helped, uh, she was kind of my dad's manager with his whole career as being an artist so now she's kind of stepped into her own yeah. time of being an artist and yeah it's super cool I, f I feel like it's well deserved and like i uh i'm happy for her absolutely it's her time yeah it's her time it's her time yeah <laughs> well heights kasim thank you so much for yeah, taking the time you. today uh it's always great talking with you we'll sit up dim sum yeah hell uh, yeah dim sum and, uh, <laughs> Uh, what's the word? Ayakwa. Yeah. Until next time. Oh, yeah. Ayakwa. So, what yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Haishka. Thanks, guys. Well, I realized that we hadn't told one story. Um, uh, about 15 years ago, I had this really vivid dream and it involved a, um, a buck and it had uh, basically one rack on the side. It came running up and the rack fell to the ground and shattered into pieces. And there was a voice that said, uh, now you need to put it back together. And so I sat with that dream for, you know, years and years. And so I came to Chaz with this dream and I said, I'd like to put this into a tattoo. Can you draw something for me that approximates? And we had lots of conversations yeah. about it. And can you, can you visualize and can you help me visualize what this dream means? And so sure enough, he uh, developed this beautiful design of a, an antler and it's got our seven clans on it, seven clan masks. And um, yeah, I just wanted to share that, that I'm, I'm wearing 
uh, you know, Chaz's artwork proudly. And I've got on the other arm, I've got uh, Tomasing Thut's um, basically Chilangan design. Nice. So I've got wow. both of the Elliot's on either arm uh, that I wear proudly. So, Aichika. Carry us on your wings. I carry you on the wings. You're the wind beneath my wings. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? How long ago did you get that antler? I think it was about eight years ago. Eight years ago. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. I think, I think I was, it was just about like getting years. out of high school or something. Yeah, I think you were still. And I remember I I came to you and I said, I don't know how to make sense of this. <laughs> you know, can you think on it? Yeah. And I thought, well, maybe he'll never get back to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you, sure enough, you did. And it's uh, it's helped me. And this is where artwork helps us in so many spiritual ways. It's helped me visualize maybe what that dream might entail and what are some of the implications. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's still about getting our families together and bringing our future generations together. So I'm trying to play that role in our family now where I'm trying to get them out to ceremony, get them out to green corn. And I think that might be, that's the best interpretation that I have to be, uh, uh, bringing people back and reconnecting them mm -hmm. with their culture, especially in our family. Yeah. yeah. So. On, yeah. On top of that too, I was like a new artist at the time and thinking about it now, like you gave me a job back when I was just kind of starting out. Yeah. It's like, it's a confidence builder for any artist who's just starting to get like a job like that. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for, you know, Absolutely. it's people like in my family that really propelled my whole career you friends with family and all that always happy to help always happy to help yeah no i just go for i just go for doing it mm -hmm.